Hey, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Wagner Show on Anchor FM. If you're interested in sponsoring my show, you can send me an email to the Mike Wagner Show at gmail.com, or you could also donate to the uh, podcast. Just go to the Donate Listen site, and um, you can also donate whatever you like. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. For those who are interested, Anchor can give you everything you need in one place for free, which means right from your phone or computer. We've got creation tools. allows you to record and edit podcasts so it sounds great. And those distribute the podcast for you so you can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple, Google, many more. And you can make money from the podcast with no minimum listenership. So download the Anchor app for free or go to Anchor FM to get started. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show brings you famous celebrities and amazing people from all over the world. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. So sit back and relax and enjoy the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Looking professional website without breaking your budget, Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition way. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and also on the YouTube channel on the Mike Wagner Show. You can subscribe to that. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Apple, and Google Play as well. And take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with a wonderful gentleman. From the other side of the Atlantic, he's the author of Mistress of the Rock and Scylla the Revenge. He's working on a uh, third book as well, too, as part of the trilogy. He worked in the travel industry for 30 years, freelance for BBC Radio and TV. He wrote for the Two Ronnies, Week Endings, and the News Headlines, and full-time copy wrote for JWT, and also created um, Two Walking as well. We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the book, mainly Mistress of the Rock, which was very fascinating. That's... Um, published by uh, Rock Hill Publishing, thanks to James Hill as well, too. And without further ado, live from the other side of the Atlantic, just comfortable in his really cozy chair and uh, having a little tea and um, enjoying a little coffee as well, too. So <laughs> let's raise a glass and some uh, tea as well to a wonderful author, ladies and gentlemen, Myron Edwards. Myron, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. So you're the author of Mistress of the Rock and Scylla the Revenge. You have a third book that's in the works that's published by Rock Hill Publishing of New York. You've been in the travel industry for 30 years, and you freelance for BBC Radio and TV. You also had a few creations as well, too, and um, we'll be talking about your book. But first, before we get into all that, uh, tell us how I got started. Um, well, the book got started basically because um – I, I'm married to a Greek Cypriot, um, English Greek Cypriot, and uh, before we got married, uh, we came over to Cyprus on holiday, because this is all about really Cyprus, the whole situation, um, and we went for a lunch at the Petra to Romeo. Petra to Romeo is the area where Aphrodite's Rock is. Now, Aphrodite's Rock is the famous, or supposedly the, the birthplace of, of the, uh, the goddess of love, Okay. Um, there's nothing there except these three rocks. That's all there is. So there's no evidence of any sort of uh, physical uh, being, being uh, of, of the uh, like a statue or anything like that representing uh, the, um, the mistress. Um, so I call her the mistress. Uh, mm -hmm. I call her Aphrodite. So effectively, we went there and we had lunch and we were looking around uh, at the place. And I said to I said to Nikki. Why is this place called Aphrodite's Rock? Uh, there's nothing here that actually represents Aphrodite's Rock. I mean, I can't see anything. If you look at the famous pictures of, of Aphrodite's Rock, you know, by Botticelli, there's no reference to the area uh, where the um, supposed, where she comes out of the, the, the sea, because Aphrodite means from the foam. That's what it means, because she was born from the foam, uh, 
I won't go into how she was born because uh, there may be people under the age of 12 listening, but if effectively um, she was created from the phone. So uh, you have this situation where I was sitting there in a restaurant and I was looking around and I saw something on the wall and this is what kicked it all off. I saw something and I thought, I don't believe it. I actually saw a picture. Now, the picture I saw was from the Cyprus Tourist Board. I believe it or not, I have never been able to find it. Now, whether this was my epiphany moment or not, I think it probably was, but I've never been able to find this, and I've done a lot of research trying to find it. But it struck me as really strange. The picture showed an image of a woman under the sea. Now, that gave me the impression that this maybe why it's called Aphrodite's Rock. And maybe this is the whole essence of the story. Mm -hmm. So what I did then was um, I didn't do any more for a while. Um, and uh, I thought, well, okay, I'll let it rest. And now we, we were in England for a while and decided that maybe it wasn't right for us to be in England anymore for reasons, family reasons. And we decided to come to Cyprus. Now, when I came to Cyprus, one of the things I intended to do was to write the screenplay. So I wrote the screenplay of Mistress of the Rock um, based on my idea of what I saw at, of, of, at the, uh, the, the time when we had lunch. And I, I thought, yeah, this is not bad. So what shall I do now? I know. I'll turn it into a book. So I wrote a book, one copy, for my wife on Christmas Day to give to her on Christmas Day. So it was a nice. Very so nice. Was, yeah. Well, uh, you know, Love Story, Petra Petra Romeo, like the Goddess of Love, etc. Christmas Day. What a nice thing to do. Just give her the book. So I gave her the book. Anyway, um, she did inclined to, to say, yeah, okay, it's nice, very good. I'm going to let other, other people read it. So other people read it. And they said, this is really good. This is, why don't you get it published, you see? So I, I looked around and uh, I, I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll look around for a publisher. So uh, I, wrote, I wrote, I saw very few publishers in Cyprus, by the way. And there was one publisher in Nicosia who I wrote to. And I said, I've got this book, I've got this story. And he said, well, have you got it as a synopsis? So I sent him the synopsis. And he said, have you got this as a book? And I said, yes. He said, come to see me on Monday in Nicosia. So I went, went up to Nicosia. Kind of a long story short, we printed the book. We did everything that we could. And then uh, we did all these wonderful things about going around and seeing people and all the rest of it and selling books, printing copies and all, all of that. And then what happened was the Great Recession happened as far as Cyprus was concerned. Mm. And in between that, I had an offer for a film that was going to be made about the Mistress of the Rock. Um, we had people like uh, Gillian Anderson. She had signed up to play one of the roles. Um, we had some other people who had done some music for us. Uh, the screenplay was done by a chap who uh, worked on the BBC with me. Um, and uh, all, all, when all said and done, um, we put it all together. Um, but then the guy who was backing it, he pulled out. So the three million or four million or whatever it was going to cost to make the film went out the window. At that point, that's when the crucial side came in because at that point, Cyprus went into free fall. Um, mm -hmm. So there was nothing. There was no finance or anything like that. And it stayed, uh, it stayed dormant for about two, three years. Um, so I, there I had this book, nothing to do. I could, couldn't find any anything uh, local-wise to do. And um, I, was, I was on LinkedIn, I think it was. Um, I was looking on there, and I came across James Hill, um, and he was an American publisher. So I, I wrote to him and said to him, look, this has already been published. Is that an issue for you? And he said, no, it's not an issue for me at all. Send me the synopsis. I sent him the synopsis. And bless his cotton socks, he, he loved it. Um, and he published it. And, and that's where we are today. He's my publisher. Uh, he has a brilliant, brilliant um, editor called Athena Paris. Um, and she basically made it come alive. She, she took the book. She made it come alive. 
Um, and I got lots and lots of people who were then saying, this is really good. You should turn it into a film. Um, I, if you go onto the website, mistressofthe-rock.com, you will see all the comments that there are on there about people loving it. There's also a YouTube video as well, which you've, you've seen, Mike, haven't you? Yes, I have. That's right. It's amazing. It should go in the film, and I was going to ask you about that, but go and continue. You're on a roll. You're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. Well, look, the, the, the one thing that I had to do was, you know, I told you about the image, the image that uh, I saw I've never been able to reciprocate, to replicate the image. Sorry, uh, I've never been able to find the image that um, that I saw, and uh, I was really frustrated. So, on my travels, when I was going around, I uh, did a lot of book sales, and I met up with a guy who did um, he did a book called Cypress from the Air, which was uh, Den- Denny Rowland. His name is. Really nice guy, Denny. Um, and I said to him, Denny, look, you're doing your Cypress for the Air books, great. Um, I'm doing mine. Have you got any pictures of Petrator Romeo from the Air? So he said, well, yeah, I've got loads. So I said, well, oh, do, you wow. mind if I use, do you mind if I use some uh, uh, or look through them? So he gave me a disc. And in this disc, I went through about maybe 100, 150 shots of uh, from the Air. And then... Just purely by, I don't know, fluke or what it was or, or something or other, this picture came up, and it was the picture of the, the, the rocks, but it was taken from a different angle. And the angle that it was taken from meant that if I turned the computer up sideways, which is what I did, mm. I could see something in the water. Okay. And I thought, I don't believe this. And I, I, I was sort of, I was a bit dumbstruck because when I turned the when I turned the image up, I saw uh, in between in the book as it, as as, it, as, it, as I explain in the book, uh, Richard, who is the, the the hero, if you like, goes out to the rock um, when he when he finds the image it, as I'm describing it to you. Um, he goes out to the rock um, and sets up this plan. And the image that he sees is the same image that I see, the same, the same principle. So I turned the, turned the screen up, and what it was was a figure of a woman. Now, you've seen it, haven't you? Yes, I have. That's right. And I also read it. You described it in great detail and everything else. And I was going to ask you uh, really quickly, too. You had a part where it's like you, 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 the, the character um, you know, talks about, uh, you know, or Richard, you know, getting into a business of, um, you know, you know, diving down to go see Aphrodite. Now, when you're in, when you guys were in Cyprus, did they actually have tours where they went down to um, see Aphrodite's rock, you know, underwater? Or was just uh, was it just like roped off and uh, just look above uh, from the water or a certain distance? Well, in in the book, um, they they basically what they do is they uh, he goes out to um, he goes out to to where the image is. And he ropes it off so that the people um, are able to go out of the rope, duck their head into the water because it's at such a level that you 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 almost got the same sort of thing as uh, like the uh, the Blarney Stone in Ireland, you know, where you uh-huh. go and you kiss the Blarney Stone. Well, the same sort of euphoria is uh, is what is trying to be created with this image in the water. So you go out to the water, you kiss the image, and when you come back up again, uh, it's, only a, it's only like two feet or whatever. So you just duck down into the water, kiss the, kiss the image, and away you go. And that is the, the essence of what the, the tourist side of it, it is. Now, if you were to go today... Down to the down to the um, down to the Petra to Romeo to the rocks itself. You could walk out and you could see the same rock as I saw. You know, from mm-hmm. that. Whether you see the image of the, the goddess is only really available from the from the air, but you will see the rock. It's between the two other rocks, the main the, the main rocks, um, and that in its in itself was the, the like if you like the catalyst for the whole story. Because that gave Richard the idea that he could create something unique. He could create something that had never been done before. Um, and at the same time, bring about a, a sort of um, 
renaissance for for the the island of cyprus that was that was his whole plan in that mm. now i tried to do a similar thing with with the actual people here in cyprus the cyprus tourist board um people from uh paphos i've tried to speak to the mayor I've, there were there were several festivities that they could have used but i'm on a shall we say um I'm on a steep incline going downwards and nobody seems to want to give me a little push upwards um, simply because uh, it, it's something that they can't quite grasp in that in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, they don't see how uh, how it works. Um, and I try to you know, not not be as entrepreneurial as as possible. But I'm trying to say to them, you have something quite unique here. You have something that other people do not have now. I, I watch American TV quite a lot because we have American TV over here. You uh, have a program about werewolves, not werewolves, um, about Bigfoot, right? Bigfoot, yes, all the time. And there's like countless and countless and countless stories about Bigfoot on right. just about every network imaginable. And I have to say this, it's like, you know, every interpretation. And I have to say this, um, I just want to make sure. He's not coming my way right here. So if I see Bigfoot, I'll let you know behind me. Yeah. So, <laughs> but Mike, what I'm saying is, there's ghosts, there's Bigfoot, there's uh, there's the Loch Ness monster, which is all now already being proved that it, it's a false thing anyway. Um, there's all these different sort of phenomena, okay? Mm -hmm. um, none of them are proven uh, in in that respect. Yeah, I have seen and to continue to see. As you will, uh, when you look at the video, a phenomena that I can't explain. Uh, I can't explain why the shape of this rock happens to look like a woman, why it happens to look like a Greek woman. Um, it has that visual uh, sort of feel to it where you, you, you can actually see um, the shape and contours of a woman in the sea. Now, you tell me, why is it that the goddess of love in, is in the place where she was reputedly born and the figure is that of a woman who could even effect, effectively be the goddess of love. That is a good question. I'll have to ask some people about that and I'll um, get back to you on that. And as I think about the question more and more, and we'll get back to the book in just a minute, you listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Looking for a professional website without breaking your budget? Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can also download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also on Radio Public, Anchor FM. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on YouTube. Also, check out the program on iTunes. Apple, Google Play, and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with author Myron Edwards, the author of Mistress of the Rock and Scylla the Revenge. We'll um, talk about that later on as well, too, on our next program. He's worked in the travel industry for 30 years, freelance for the BBC Radio and TV, and also um, full-time copyright at JWT. And we talked about uh, Mistress of the Rock, and of course, you know, you asked that question about... Um, the image about, um, you know, what I would think and everything. I'll probably ask my lovely wife, who's probably like an Aphrodite as well, too. But in my mind, she's still a wonderful Aphrodite. I mean, of course, when you're married, it's like you, you still think your wife as an Aphrodite. So it's something to reinforce, I have to say. And there was one question I had as well, too, that, um, you know, Richard being an entrepreneur, you know, having scuba diving equipment, having like a, a hook or a crane, you can go down into the sea and be able to kiss. Now, you know, if, if you were in Greece and someone um, came up to you and uh, say, um, you know, have you go down and scuba dive and uh, check out uh, Aphrodite, Mrs. Other Rock, would you do it? Yeah, I, I mean, yes. I'm, it, that's, all, that, that's a question that's been put to me before. Um, I've walked out to the rock um, because you don't need to actually dive down. The idea is that you walk out maybe 10 or 15 feet. 
um, out into the water and the waves are reasonably good. They're not uh, particularly high at that point. Um, and you walk out and it, in the actual book itself, um, there is a, there is a guide rope uh, which people follow at, up to the point where they actually then, uh, if you like, bend down into the water and uh, kiss the rock or, or do whatever they want or touch the rock and then come back up again and then go down the guide rope so that the next lot can come up. So, yes, I mean, yeah, you, you, if you go down there, but you, again, if you went to the if you went to the actual site today, you would have to see it from the air rather than see it from the ground level, because all you'll see is a rock from the ground level. You, mm -hmm. you don't get the image until you see it from the air. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also in the book as well, too. It, it called out the name of Richard, Richard, in like a, a siren voice in, uh, yeah, in, a, in yeah. a female form. Now, now, now of course, if you uh, went over there, um, did you actually get to uh, hear the sounds? Will people get to hear the sounds or are you allowed to uh, imagine it in, in your mind? No, you imagine it in your mind because uh, you, you've got to you've got to consider that um, my my story is a. Uh, a story based fictional, um, but with with possible fact as well. Um, but you have to have a, a, a. You either believe or you don't believe. It's as simple as that, really. Mm -hmm. If you think the image is is what it represents, you believe it. If you don't believe it, you don't believe it. It's fine. Um, but I've had lots of people who um, on the YouTube uh, thing, for example. They write, um, I've never heard of this before, and I've lived in Cyprus all my life or whatever, and I've never seen this before, and I'm quite astonished. I can't believe people haven't grabbed hold of this, you know, from a point of view of uh, marketing it as a, mm -hmm. as a valuable tourist attraction, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't and, believe that either. And, of, and, of course, you talked about uh, Greece uh, going into uh, financial plunder as well, too. Well, Cyprus, and, and, yeah, yeah. Or Cyprus, Cyprus yes. Together. Yeah, I mean, Greece was first, um, and then Cyprus followed. Um, they thought Cyprus would avoid it, but the, uh, the, the, pro the problem was that Cyprus and Greece are, are very much akin to each other. Uh, Cyprus sees Greece as being the motherland. So if you come here, you will see Greek flags flying everywhere, um, you know, from that point of view. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, the, 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 the problem was when, when, the, when, the, when the difficulties happened in Greece, Cyprus was quickly to follow on, even though I thought it would avoid it. And a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people committed suicide, actually, oh, believe yeah. it or not. Um, the, because the financial constraints were so bad that, um, you know, they, they had met our bank closed down. And it was a horrendous time. And it lasted for about eight to nine months. So... You know, mm -hmm. if you're if you're trying to um, if you're trying to put something together like a film with no budget again, you know, it's it's impossible from that point of view. Mm -hmm. I would like to one like to say one thing. Um, I think Cyprus has woken up to the possibilities of a film industry. Mm -hmm. They've now got a thing called Olive Wood. Believe it. Or olive, not. olive. Olive Wood. Interesting. Olive Wood. Yeah. Um, olive Wood. And, uh, there's a first the first film that is being made is called Jiu Jitsu and it stars um Knight Rider guy. Uh, not not Knight Rider. Um Nick Cage. Stars Nick Cage. Nicholas uh, Cage, yes. Yes. And there's a Greek director Dimitri, but I can't remember his surname. He's um, he's he's the very famous di director of all these uh, Kung Fu films. Um, and he's Greek um and he came over about uh, two weeks ago um he was over here for about four weeks six to four to six weeks making this movie so i presume it's going to be out next year features uh, nicholas cage um and they say they have about another three or four films in the um, in the making uh that are happening in Hollywood. now i'm trying to get my uh screenplay out into the into the market so that we could make a film in Cyprus and bring the Mistress of the Rock to life in, in the movie. That's what my ambition is. So, mm -hmm. 
And, and would you try to get, bring back Gillian Anderson and the ones you had uh, proposed to, or would you go after um, another star, like say maybe of um, higher caliber, or maybe like um, you know lower cost or lower budget and everything like that? Maybe like um, an up and coming star or something. I uh, I think at the end of the day, it, it's somebody who has the right sort of um, shall we say belief in the project and and how they they envisage what they can do with the project. Um, it doesn't matter too much if they're unknown. In fact, I like the Aphrodite character to actually be an unknown person um, because um, it would be very difficult, I think, unless you got, you know, I don't, well, I can't even really think of, of anyone um, in my own mind that um, w- would be the best person to play that role. But um, I would like, I, I, we did run a competition when we were trying to do the first film to find an Aphrodite. Um, and uh, like everything else, you know, when, when, when it all just died down and it did die down, everybody just dropped out. Um, because the money, once the money had gone, everybody just lost, lost heart. That was the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, with the new thing with, um, you know, Aphrodite going down and kissing the rock and witnessing the rock and everything. And of course, with the Cyprus and Greeks um, markets uh, being backing up, would it be a good time to um, open up as a tourist attraction for um, the new Aphrodite? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I totally. I, I mean, if film, if, if you look at what happens when you make a film um, and the follow up to that. Uh, so many films have been made and then the people come to see the location where it is afterwards uh, as tourists. So from that point of view, you know, I mean, OK, the people go to Paris, but there was also the Da Vinci Code that they went to see in the Lourdes, uh, uh, the, um, the, the museum. Um, the, what's it called? Museum. Um, Let's see. I'm trying yeah, to think the the, the Louvre yeah. or no yeah the Louvre yeah the Louvre the, yes the Louvre where, where, yeah we're in the Louvre uh, where where the where the 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 the, um, the, the main uh, area of the Louvre where the, um, the the Da Vinci Code was uh, was set and of course everybody went to, to went to see that and then they went to see the church and in Scotland. This in its own in its own way would generate. It does get good tourism now anyway, but not it's not significant tourism in its own way. Um, one one person wrote in a, a few years ago that Cyprus has got a tourist magnet, but it doesn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, now that in, in its own way is an indictment of the problem that we have. You have a situation where you've got something truly unique um but people do not know how to market that particular situation Mm -hmm. um whereas if you had a movie it would almost market itself do do, do you know what you see what i mean correct correct yeah it's like saying with um you know you had like uh, the da vinci code being at the um at the louvre or, um or a major attraction in paris it would just come itself like say if you did um a movie in london and focus on big ben Big Ben yeah. pretty much speaks for itself, and Aphrodite, yeah. you found a way to um, ba- basically just um, you know, highlight it and have a film surrounding it. Aphrodite yes. Rock would, would sell itself. I totally understand. So landmarks pretty much sell itself. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. Um, I'm trying to well, – well, my idea is to sort of leave a legacy for the island in as much as, um, you know, by, by giving people the idea that there is more to Aphrodite's rock than what they think there is. So that in its own way would generate its uh, – we generate tourism uh, based on on the book and based on the film. So that's mm. that's, the, that's the essence of it. And, and of course, too, you also created um, a, a device which um, ha- has like walking maps to assist uh, commuters. You developed that and something good for Greece. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Looking professional website without breaking your budget, Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com.
SonicWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, watch the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show. Also, you can check out um, Apple, iTunes, Google Play, as well as Anchor FM, Radio Public, and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with author Myron Edwards of Mrs. of the Rock and his second book, Scylla the Revenge. We'll be um, talking about that uh, before we wrap up and uh, also for a next program as well, too. He worked in the travel industry for 30 years, freelance for BBC, radio and TV, and gave us a really good insight to the book, Mrs. of the Rock, inv- involving uh, Aphrodite and the rock itself. And, of course, we encourage you to check out the book published by um, Rock Hill Publishing of New York. And you also created a device, which is a sub, so what, short walking maps to assist commuters and tourists. It's called Tube Walking. And when I read about that, that sounds really interesting. So um, tell us all about it. Okay. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But um, it, one night I was coming back from – well, I used to do work in the West End in Chinatown. And uh, one night I was coming back from Tottenham Court Road. Um, and unfortunately, in those days, the underground wasn't as uh, proficient as it is these days. London Underground is very good these days. But in those days, you used to have strikes. You used to have all kinds of different bits of problems, problems with the underground. And the buses weren't working this particular night. So uh, I was uh, forced, because I, um, I lived in Essex and I had to go back to um, Liverpool Street. So I was forced to walk. But instead of walking in the normal direction that I would have taken, I, I took shortcuts. And I, these shortcuts, I, I worked out. But by the time I got to Liverpool Street, my shortcut distance had gone to about 25 minutes, which mm-hmm. normally would have taken me maybe 40 minutes. Wow. So I thought, hold on a minute. Now, if I can do this from Tottenham Court Road in 25 minutes, maybe there's maybe there's something else that I can do. Um so I started walking around a few places, um, and then the sort of kismet situation happened. Um, I met a taxi driver the night, uh, um, after, a couple of nights after, um, and he was saying, "Yeah, well, of course, with the knowledge that you, you know, a taxi driver has, uh, he's able to um, he's able to to create routes for you." Um, using shortcuts so basically what i did was i took the the idea of a taxi driver's knowledge using shortcuts Hmm. and interpret them on a map um take out all the 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 normal sort of map type stuff and just leave yourself with with routes so in other words if you were going for say um bank to st paul's you'd go uh, forward, in, forward from uh, the station Liverpool Street. Then you turn right, and then you turn left, and then you go forward, and then you turn right again, and then you turn left, and then you work it out, and then you find that you probably got there in just under sixteen minutes. So we would time it, and we would then also show the route and everything else. And we did this for the city. We did it for West End. We did it for theatres. We did it for. Um, for um, uh, a river walk as well, and we did it for a royal walk, which meant you 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 visited the palaces and that sort of situation. Interesting. Uh, and we sold these little books for about one pound fifty in those days. Uh, I don't suppose you remember Filofax. Do you remember Filofax? Fire. Fi- Firefox, Filefax, no, or no, Firefax was like a like um, a diction, like a diary thing that you used to carry around in the eighties. It was very trendy. So we had these Firefax mm. maps, which you put into this Firefax uh, folder, and we used to have those as well. Um, Firefax, we, okay, now, now I got it. Okay, it yeah. took me a little bit to uh, oh, register. Yeah, no, now I now I got it. Good. I mean that uh, in hindsight, if if I'd been clever um, and, and sort of sort of thought about it, what I should have done, um, and I don't know how far Apple or any of those were at this stage, but what I should have done was take the idea to somebody like Apple, and then create the maps which you'll see today on every Apple phone or uh, every sort of um, every other mobile device. 
um, and give it to them uh, for them to market because when you're marketing something you need the you need the power of somebody behind you who can actually uh, be able to generate um, sales and I didn't have that because I, all I was doing was selling it on my own um, right. and, and I, you know I sold a few a few books uh, over the period of time and that sort of thing um, and um, yeah, eventually we got to a stage where a guy was going to buy it. Uh, he was going to take it over. Then his company went bust. So it, unfortunately, it, it never it never materialized. So I put it onto the web, and um, the the maps themselves were just uh, on available for people to download. And in fact, I still get now today. I got uh, a request for four maps again. You know, so. It's it, it was on the map. It was on the web. I don't know if it's still on there anymore because uh, mm -hmm. you know um, it, it probably has run its did run its time. At the time, it was very good. We had uh, we had a lot of fun with it. I did TV, radio interviews, and things, and we raised money for charity using the same idea as well. Oh, nice! Very yeah. nice. It, yeah. it, it it almost sounds like the early days of GPS, which is being used and. If, if you were to uh, apply, like, say, the uh, tube walking convert to GPS, do, do you think uh, somebody in Cyprus or Greece will be able to buy into it? And I'm sure that could be very well used right now, you know, especially leading up to Aphrodite's Rock. Well, um, for, unfortunately, my um, <laughs> Cyprus people don't walk anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you. I'm not telling Fibs. Like, if there was a, they have what's called a baripteron. A uh, baripteron is a news agent or a, a, a tobacconist, as you would have in the, in the States. And they would get out of their car, go 50 yards down the road, open the car door, go into the tobacconists and take by their whatever they're buying, newspapers, sweets, chocolates or whatever, and then get back in their car and drive away. Walking. As you can imagine, in this temperature as well, is a bit yeah, a bit difficult. It's not it's not seen as being the best place to walk. London, Paris, yes, great. Rome, even as well. And in fact, we did have uh, at one stage the idea of going um, to Paris and uh, producing well, tube walking maps for Paris because it would have been easy to do for the metro, you know, for mm. in Paris. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was good experience. It was a good experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, you also had uh, 30 years in travel industry and also a lot of experience for the BBC radio and TV. And uh, maybe you can tell us about uh, how you first got involved with the BBC. Very fascinating. Um, that was – I used to write with a guy called Phil Campbell, who um, – he, he, he worked at Hammer Films um, when um, – when he was uh, younger, um, and he started a couple of Harold books as well, um, but he he and I were in the same rock band together, believe it or not. Oh, really? Uh, I used to play drums, and he, he was the lead singer, um, and we did a couple of things together, uh, like we did a German tour uh, in the 70s, um, and we did some, um, some other stuff as well. We made some... We made uh, recordings, not not none that you would you would that would ever get onto sort of BBC and things like that. Right. Uh -huh. And eventually, eventually, the band got to a point where uh, it, it it got to its uh, sell by date, if you like. Um, and then Philip Phil said to me, "Well, look, I, I'm going to write for some hospital radio t uh, shows, some comedy scripts, because um, he'd worked uh, at." Um, He'd worked on various things at, when he was at the Hammer, and that he was very clever with his uh, with his scripts and stuff. And um, and basically, he said to me, "Would you like to to help me with uh, writing some comedy?" So I said, "Well, I've never done it before." So <laughs> I did some of the I did some of the comedy in terms of writing the scripts, but I also did the actual um, I did I did, did the actual production itself. So I was. Uh, actors in the in this uh, Charing Cross Hospital radio, believe it or not. Um, and we had about, say, 25, 30 scripts or whatever. Um, the hospital radio decided that it wasn't going to be something that they would continue for one reason or another. So we had all these scripts left over. So Bill sent a few scripts to the two bodies and uh, other places like uh, Hudlines and things like that. And they got picked up 
which I couldn't believe. And the two Roddies picked it up for their Christmas show. Um, one of one of, it's like, and it's uh, it's still now running on. If you see a Christmas show on the two Roddies, that the gag that we did um, is still there. You know, and it, it's hard to believe it all these years later. But um, we still get royalties for it, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, like 20, twenty pence comes through or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm, and, and that in many ways kicked off my whole writing career in, in that respect, because when I started to, to do that, um, I, I then got into a stage where I was writing on a, on a weekly basis for um, the, the shows that I would told you about, mm-hmm. um, Mudlines, Week Endings, um, The Ronnies itself, and then we would, get, we would uh, be, be invited to write things for, um, for various TV shows. Um, I did one in Scotland, which was a kick up the 80s, which uh, starred Tracy Ullman. You mm-hmm. know Tracy Ullman? Yeah. Yes, well, Tracy Ullman. Was, Tracy Ullman, um, this was one of her first shows. Um, yeah. And one of the sketches that I did featured her. So wow. uh, it's quite, quite chuffed of, from that point of view. Um, and then um, I, I did some other bits and pieces. Um with various people, Alfred Marx um, was a very famous in, in English comedian, very stoic comedian, um, and I did some bits with him. And uh, there was a lady, a very talented lady, who died very young, called Marty Kane. Oh. So I did some bits with her as well. Um, and, and then, you know, as, as things went, we drifted. Uh, we drifted away. Uh, he, I got married. He got married. Um, and then uh, we sort of uh, dr- dropped our partnership a little bit to a certain extent. He didn't write anymore. I, I didn't do anything much uh, comedy-wise. Uh, we had to find jobs, so we had to earn money. You know, from that point of view, there wasn't enough in terms of freelance writing to be able to continue. Um, and, that, and that really is what happened. Um, and then I, I started to dabble with books and things. So I wrote a couple of books, um, not not printed books, nothing nothing like that. Just just give me a bit of experience in writing books and screenplays. Um, and and uh, I did a few screenplay things as well. Um, so yeah, I'm that that gave me a little bit more sort of impetus. But I didn't start writing until I came out here uh, because at that stage um, I. I didn't have really anything to write about. It was just uh-huh. this epiphany thing with, with the Mistress of the Rock to kick everything off. Um, and then since then, I've written um, maybe four or five other books as well, which uh, uh, are in the pipeline sort of thing as well. Mm-hmm. And you also got a second book, too, called Scylla the Revenge, which we'll be talking about. And uh, just give us a little, uh, very brief background about it. We'd like to have you on um, next time. We'll talk further about the book. Okay, um, what is it, the, the basis of um, the mistress is that um, Richard, uh, Richard, Richard Cole, who is the uh, the English um, corporal or in the in the book, witnesses something that changes him, and he has a PS, PTSD uh, situation. Now he witnesses something. I think Mike, you're probably familiar with this, uh, Jarhead or something like that. The film. It mm-hmm. was based on Highway 80. Now, the story evolves around Highway 80 in the um, first Gulf War. Now, you're, you, uh, you know that the first Gulf War, as far as the land war is concerned, lasted 20 or 24 hours, 72 hours in total. Um, there was very little in the way of action. Once it got into Kuwait, that was it, except what happened on Highway 80. So, Richard is seconded by his sergeant to go as his witness uh, to find out what's happening on Highway 80. And he he uh, doesn't expect anything to be, uh, shall we say, uh, and he doesn't expect anything. He's just, uh, he's just going there as a witness. But what he witnesses changes his whole persona because the, the horrors that he encounters on that particular journey uh, have great... Um, emotional uh, things for him. They, they create so, so much sort of vivid dreams that he has, which are recurring nightmares and things uh, throughout his life. 
Um, and what his his uh, one safeguard is that he keeps coming back to Aphrodite because when he goes first of all to the Gulf War, he's in a helicopter and he's flying over the rocks. And as he flies over the rocks, he turns his head and walks and looks back at the rocks and says to him, uh, says to the says to almost like the, the goddess herself, please keep me safe. And there's like a beacon that flashes in behind him as if it's a signal saying, yes, I'll keep you safe, you know. Mm. Um, and that, in, it, that in, his, in its own way is what he conjures up in his mind. This is, uh, this is his thing. He believes that he's going to be kept safe from all, uh, from all disasters, from all horrors of, of the war. Um, and Aphrodite is going to be his guardian sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then really, uh, it doesn't work out like that because what he, what he witnesses on Highway 80 is so traumatic for him that uh, he, he wants to escape. And as he tries to escape, so he, he gets himself into a situation of like a nightmare sort of scenario. And the only relief that he gets is when he encounters, I don't want to spoil it for the, the readers, but he encounters what he believes is Aphrodite. Mm-hmm. And she keeps him safe and says, I will keep you safe always. You know? mm-hmm. and, and of course, uh, and- we'll t- and, of course, we'll talk more about the book as well, too. I'd like to have you on back of the show talking more about the book and a preview of the um, third book as well, too. And, of course, um, I, I, I forgot to ask you as well, too, since you've been the, um, the entry for 30 years, you wrote for BBC TV and radio, and I uh, forgot to ask you, who are your favorite writers and um, some of your uh, favorite actors or uh, singers back in the day or what you watch uh, during uh, England? Um, my my, I would say Queen. Um, I recently watched the the new mo- the new movie on Queen that came out, which was brilliant. Um, oh, it's fantastic! Uh, Love absolutely. Freddie Mercury. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Queen. Uh, I did see the Rolling Stones live um, at Hyde Park, and I also saw Cream. I liked Fleetwood Mac. I saw them live. I saw um, Amy Corner. Believe it or not. Um, uh, of course, the Beatles. Well, I grew up with the Beatles anyway, and I love Elvis. Uh, I think Elvis is an, in, uh, the showman in, in in every way, and Vince was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elton John. Um, I was very lucky with with the music that I grew up with, um, and and uh, you know that sort of thing. Led Zeppelin because we played a lot of Red Zeppelin. We played a lot of Status Quo as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that sort of thing. As far as writers are concerned. Um, George MacDonald Fraser, I don't know if you've ever heard of George MacDonald Fraser, but he wrote the Flashman series. Um, and I was very fortunate enough to get his autograph just before he died. Uh, brilliant, brilliant books. Absolutely. Flashman is based on the Tom Brown School Days bully. And it's after the, um, after the time when he leaves uh, rugby school and um, he, he becomes his own man. Um, he, he's, he's something of a, 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 a um, an anti-hero, but everybody loves him because he visit. He goes to. He he's always involved in things historically, uh, which are fact. So if there was, uh, you know, like for example, there is a a piece in the um, uh, one book. I can't remember which book it is, where W. G. Grace, who was a very famous cricketer. Um, he was playing at the Lords, the um, the cricket ground, and the uh, idea is that Flashman bowls to him three times. He uh, he bowls uh, these people, um, and he gets the other people. If you follow cricket, he gets the other people who are on the other uh, on on WGC Grace's uh, side out, which means they they have to bring in a new batsman. And at the end of the uh, at the end of the innings, he, he's bowled out three people. Um, and he takes his hat off and throws it to um, W. G. Grace, and they, they, and Grace turns around and says, "Well, that's a hat trick, my boy." And that <laughs> has coined the 
that coined the expression hat trick. That's the sort of thing that interesting M- McDonald Fraser would do. He he was just uh, brilliant. Uh, as far as the other writers are concerned, um, Stephen King. Um, I like the classics, J- uh, Charles Dickens, of course, um, and I, I things like um, uh, the. the um, I'm just trying to think. Hey, when you when you put on the spot like that, I, it's difficult. Um, it, it, yeah. It's okay. The answer will come later. I'm sure it's okay. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to get the other name. Um, no, it's okay. It's gone. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, what was the? Uh, so your other question was. Uh, Oh, okay. and, I, I, and I think there's also TV shows. And of course, you know, when people mention you work with the BBC or involved with the BBC, Monty Python, I'm sure, will come to mind. And, um, and of course. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, <laughs> Python, was, Python was the original. Um, I, I also would like to say that the sitcoms of uh, like the Only Fools and the Horses, absolute genius. Ron, Ronnie Barker, who was one of the uh, two people in um, the. the um, the two Ronnies, he had a series called Porridge, which would again today never be uh, never be shown, um, which was all about prison. Uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and he also did a thing called Open All Hours, which was a shopkeeper. Um, but he was a comic genius. I mean, this guy was just amazing, absolutely incredible, so funny. Uh, he, he was really, really clever. And having somebody like Ronnie Corbett as his as his, as his uh, second player if you like um mm-hmm. was very was was they were the perfect sort of duo they had the, you know they worked so well so well together corbett wasn't so much um, a single comedian although he did he did do a couple of um, shows on his own one of them was sorry i think but the guy that um i worked with a uh, chap called ian davidson was the script editor on, on sorry um so it, there were a few there were a few things that uh, they used to you do together and he was a script editor on the um, on the two Ronnies as well so we got to know Ian, Ian Davidson quite well one way or another um, uh, go, go ahead I'm sorry no 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 I'm, I'm just thinking of the other sort of uh, comedy shows that you would know um, The Office did you did you ever watch what, The Office we, my, my daughter loves The Office. I got to watch The Office. That, too, is hilarious. And, of course, it did a lot of other spinoffs involving The Office. And another one I thought of, too, which is another nice spinoff of uh, Monty Python is Faulty Towers. And that was a really brilliant oh, yeah. one. John Kreese yeah. really got himself in the spotlight in that one. Yeah, I mean, Faulty Towers was, was a one-off. Um, and, and it was pure comic genius as well because uh, – <clears throat> When you consider that um, John Cleese and um, Connie Booth were going through a, a, a divorce uh, at the time, and yet they could put, do their performances on on screen, absolutely incredible. Um, mm. You know, they were just wonderful. Uh, that they, they, they only he only made I think thirteen episodes, and he said he wouldn't do any more um, because he didn't want to break the mold. Um, but it, it was and still is a, a piece of. Uh, Writing genius, he, he, you know, Cleese is very good. Have you ever seen Cleese do educational videos? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I'm. I, I think I remember about the educational videos, and he also had a book that was called uh, "How to Irritate People" or somewhere along the lines. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's got that. He's got that sort of enigma, in in, in as much as his personality does that. Um, and, and the, great, the great thing about Python was that they were all, even though they were all individuals together as a collective, they they were they were just fantastic. <laughs> oh, I hear a special guest in the background and uh, saying, uh, "Hey, I want some attention too." It's like, come on, yeah. go to Aphrodite, go out to Aphrodite. <laughs> yeah, no, he's a he's a just saw a cat, I think. Uh, so, uh, oh, he saw uh, a cat. Well, they can bring him in and enjoy the show. So if, if your dog happens comes on, you can get him on a show, too. We'll do that next time. <laughs> so, and who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Hi. Hi. Hello. I'll be on the show. We can do it next time. <laughs> Come here. Uh, he's going on. Oh, you did. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. And uh, just a couple of things here uh, before we let you go. You've been fantastic, Myron. Who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Um, that's a very good question. Um, 
Do I think is my biggest thing? You mean, in, in, in my working career, I would say the, the boss that I worked with in Chinatown, he was a very big influence, a chap called Tony. Um, but in my writing career, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's very difficult because the, 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 the idea of a writer is that basically he's a single person. Um, they don't necessarily have a, a support mechanism except when you go to the publisher, for example. Um, so in terms of actual in terms of actual inspiration, I have some people like my. I have an agent in in London called uh, Lily. She's been a big inspiration to me. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put anyone in particular um, as being my um, my my biggest influence in that way. Family wise, I suppose everybody in the family, wife wise, and and kids. They, they would they would be my biggest influences um, because you know they, you're doing it for for not just for yourself but you're doing it for them as well so yeah I mean that, that I would say they they have the biggest influence over me in that mm. respect that is fantastic too and uh, what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point um well, the best advice I can give somebody is if they want to be a writer, it's 99% perspiration, 1% creativity mm -hmm. um, or inspiration because you've got to, if you've got to, you've got to want to do it. Uh, everybody says they want to write a book. Everybody could write a book. The difference is just sitting down and doing it. That's, that's the whole essence of it. If you, if you have a story and the story's original, or even if it's a story about your family and you want to tell people about it, then do it. Just write it. Tell people about it. You, you may never, ever get it published, but at least if you ever get it out of your system, then that's one thing that you can you can say you've done. That's one thing that you can say you've achieved. Um, there are very few people that will go on to be, uh, shall we say, master booksellers or, or, or um, bestsellers in, in that respect uh, because you need the marketing behind you, you need the, the, the power behind you of a big organisation if you're going to become like the next um, yeah, uh, Harry Potter, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling. You, you've got to have somebody who's going to be able to put your name in front of everybody, which mm -hmm. is why I'm particularly grateful to you as well because you carry a lot of influence and um you know from that perspective if if i can get people to have a look at mistress of the rock and they can and they can see the value of it then maybe somebody also in the film industry might also say this guy's got a good idea why don't we make a film you know so from that but that perspective it, that's that's what i would say I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to having you on again soon. Talk about your second book, Still of the Revenge. Also your third book as well, too. And a recap on Mistress of the Rock. And um, and before we wrap up here, and I'm sure um, your, your uh, dog wants to get you out to um, – to, to uh, Aphrodite well, uh, take me for a walk. He, he me wants Aphrodite. a walk. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he is if he wants a walk. So. Oh, there you go. Or right, And uh, tell, tell everybody once again your upcoming projects, your website, how the people contact you, and where can they purchase your books? Okay. Um, well, uh, my website is www.mistressoftherock.com, which also has links to www.skyla, uh, the book, co.uk uh, you can contact me through Rock Hill Publishing which is James Hill um, and you can also uh, find it on Amazon uh, Amazon has it I believe several American bookshops have it as well um, you, you can find it on um, on most uh, most book sites uh, have got if you go into a Google search, you'll be able to see all the different sites that have the book featured. 
So that, that is amazing. And Myron, just want to say it's been a great pleasure talking to you. We thank you for your time. Looking forward to having you on again soon. And we'll definitely have you on for your second book, Silly the Revenge. And please do everybody a favor, including yours truly, keep us up to date. I will, Myron. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate the opportunity. Have a good evening. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. Also, become a sponsor of the program and or donate today at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of The Mike Wagner Show.